It's good to have things to celebrate, isn't it? God continues to bless us even when we see things in the world around us that scare us, frighten us. We know that He is still God. He is still in control. As we start a new year together, I wanted to spend some time looking into God's Word to see why we're here. And I'm glad you're here today. But you don't have the sign behind you. So let's see if anybody can remember the sign before Christmas that told us why we were here. What does it normally say? Worship, grow, and share. We've boiled down some of our purposes, our mission, into three words just to make it easier for us to think about and to focus on. Is church essential? The Supreme Court and the Constitution seem to think so. You think so. We're here. This is essential that we worship together and that we worship on our own. So what is worship? Why do we come out? And does it make a difference if you're here or not? Those are some of the questions I want to answer this morning. I'm not going to go through this in detail because we're going to talk about worship this week. We're going to talk about grow and then share. But if you want to jot down these verses in your notes, Luke 10, 27, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, and Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Those are the verses that give us the concepts for worship, grow, and share. The mission of First Baptist Church is to develop missionary disciples who worship God, grow spiritually, and share the gospel and their spiritual gifts. As we worship, our lives were meant to glorify God. We just sang that song. As you recognize your purpose in life, God created you to worship Him. And that means you have to know Him if you're going to be able to worship Him. And then as we know God through Jesus Christ, our Savior, We're called to grow. We're called to develop as disciples and help other people grow spiritually in maturity and grow in fellowship together. And then the final one, share. We're called to share the good news, to tell everyone around us, tell the world the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth to save us from our sins, to offer eternal life to all those who would believe. And we're also called to share the gifts that God has given each and every believer. In addition to your talents and abilities, God gives each believer spiritual gifts which are meant to build up and glorify and edify the church, other people. They're not meant to bring attention to yourself. And there are a lot of people who kind of get off in the wrong direction thinking about spiritual gifts. It's all about them and what they can do. It's about other people and how you can love and serve them. So those are the things we're going to be talking about in the coming weeks. As we look at worship this morning, you may have heard someone say about our church, I just love the worship at First Baptist Church. Mark and Julie do such an amazing job leading us, leading us in singing about our great God. You may have heard some other people say, I don't really like that song. That's not my style. I don't know it. And I just can't really worship with that kind of music. It's not what I'm used to. Some people might say, well, actually, a lot of people said in our previous church in Indiana, we had a huge worship choir, 60 people. Almost every Sunday, they were up there singing out praises to God. And when our church had an earthquake and we were reduced to worshiping in our fellowship hall, which is about half the size of this, a lot of people left because they didn't have the big choir. They didn't have the, you could call it a show, if, if that's the way they were thinking of it. I love choirs, I love singing, but if you're only coming because of what you want or what you like, then your focus is not in the right place. And those are the questions that I'd like to address. What is worship and why do we gather together? If we looked at the dictionary, Merriam-Webster website, we'd see that worship means to honor or show reverence for as a divine being or a supernatural power. We think about that as worshiping God. You also hear people who worship 
a musician or an idol or someone that they think is so great, and that's maybe showing great or extravagant respect or devotion to someone. They worship the ground that someone walks on. We use that term for people and for things as well. The Bible says something very different. God's Word tells us that worship is not just what we do with our actions. It's not just about singing. It's a matter of what's happening in our hearts and what's going on in our thoughts and our attitudes. God created us as image bearers to show the world what He's like, and He calls that worship. When we love Him and when we show others what He's like, that is worship Him, worshiping Him. That's bringing glory to God. It's showing other people, magnifying who God is by our actions. So is it just the singing? Is it the first portion of the service? Now we're done with worship and now we can go on? No, the whole thing. If we are worshiping correctly, the whole service should be about God, bringing glory to Him, honoring Him. Jesus said that the greatest commandment in Scripture is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the focus of our whole being, loving God with everything. And then we see in Psalm 95, 6, the psalmist said, Oh, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. We sang that song this morning. Worshiping God means recognizing not only that we're to glorify Him, but that we should be humble before God. We should be bowing down before Him, not just physically on our knees bowing as you would before a king, but that we recognize that He, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, deserves our worship and our praise. We need to humble our hearts and kneel before God. Where we spend our time, where our thoughts linger, what our goals in our life, how we use our money, all indicate who or what we are worshiping. Even a person who would say they are totally non-religious, they have no interest in spiritual things, is still a worshiper. They're still ascribing value and honor to something or someone in their lives. And the question is, who or what is that? As we come together on Sunday mornings, we call it our worship service because we want to honor and glorify God. We want to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. We don't want to be ashamed of talking about Him because He's our Lord and Savior. Everything that we do on Sunday mornings should be part of that worship. Does that leave out Monday through Saturday? It doesn't. Our whole week, our whole lives should be worship. 1 Corinthians 10.31 So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So the way I eat, my eating habits, glorify God? Could they not glorify God? They could. How I spend my money, could that bring glory to God or could it Shame, the name of Jesus, the way I spend my money, what I'm watching, what I'm listening to, where my thoughts linger, my desires, all of those things are meant to glorify God, whatever we do. Your life at home, your life in your neighborhood, work, school, wherever you are, we're called to be worshiping God. The opposite of worshiping God is talked about a lot in Scripture. And God says, I'm a jealous God. And we hear that word jealous and we think, how can God be jealous? Because he's supposed to be love and everything that's perfect and pure. Well, if God is perfect and pure and deserving of all of our worship, is it wrong to not worship him? It is. And that's called idolatry. And God warns about idolatry in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Anytime we love or serve someone or something more than God, we're practicing idolatry. If you place your spouse or your kids before your relationship with God, 
God says, that's not the right order of things. And that, that's hard for us, right? As, as parents, as grandparents, as aunts and uncles, we love our families. And we think they should be the most important part of our lives. And God says, start with me, and then the rest of your life is going to fall into the right order. Because if you love me with everything, you're going to love others the right way. If you put me first, you're going to put others first instead of yourself. Having God first in our lives orders the rest of our lives so that things are in line with him. I used to think idolatry was just the little wooden statues that you'd hear about or bronze Buddhas, and we'd say, oh, okay, yeah, we don't do that. We're okay. We're not pagan. That's the word we would use, right? We're not an uncivilized society worshiping little things. But that's far from the truth because idolatry is the greatest trap that people encounter, and that's why God warns against it so many times. Thinking that something is more important than God means we would be ready to disobey God and not care about what he says in order for that thing or that person to be foremost in my life. Pastor Brad Bigney, who's in Kentucky, had this great way of looking at what's an idol in your life? What's an idol in your heart? What's something that's in the wrong place? It could be totally good, but if it's taking the place of God, first place, then it's wrong. Am I willing to sin to get this? The promotion, the relationship, even time with someone. Am I willing to sin against God and dishonor what he said to do in order to get this thing? If I think I'm going to lose this thing, will I sin to keep it? Peace and quiet. Is that a bad thing? Is it good to have a, a moment of quiet and solitude? Yeah, that's great. But when one of your kids or grandkids or a neighbor or a coworker breaks into that, is your first response attacking and saying, can't you leave me alone? And we just respond in an un unloving way and we want to protect what's ours. Do I turn to this thing or this person as a refuge or a comfort instead of God? When I've had a horrible day, do I pour out my heart to God who says, cast your cares and your burdens on me because I care for you? Don't worry because I'm taking care of you. But instead of going to God, I go to binge watch the British cooking baking show and I just sit and watch that for hours instead and I just feel better. God wants me to come to him. Is it wrong to watch the show? Maybe if it makes me overeat a lot, but otherwise it's an okay show. Is God the one I go to when things are bad? Or when things are good? Do I praise and thank God first? Or do I run around telling everybody, look what I did, look what I did, look how great things are going. <laughs> how great things are going. Sorry, I'll just put that right there. Good thing I still have this microphone. <laughs> Idols are all around us, and they could be disguised as things like financial security, physical pleasure, comfort, our reputation. No one's going to make me look bad. Our family, our relationships, having power or control, I want things to go just a certain way, and when they don't, don't cross me. If these things are more important to us than God, if these things are more important to us than the people God has put around us, then they have become idols in our hearts, and God calls us to leave them and return to him. In 1 John, the apostle said, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. This is not the Old Testament Israelites. This is the church, us, believers today. Keep yourselves from idols. Putting God first means worshiping him, having him at the center of our lives. And it really starts with our hearts. So worship is something individual that I do 
every waking moment of my day. But we're also called to worship together with other believers. And I'm just going to share two examples with you, a longer one in the Old Testament and then a shorter one from the New Testament. If you have your Bible with you and you want to turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, that's in the Old Testament, you have 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, and then 1 Chronicles. In my Bible, Adam, it's page 414. So if anybody has this same Bible, you know where we are. If you have your pew Bible, I thought I wrote it down. It's 322. Look at that. I did. Yay. Something went right. This passage from the history of Israel is a wonderful example of what worshiping God should and could look like. Did Israel always get it right? No. They messed up a lot of times. And it's easy for us to stand here a couple thousand years later, read their history and say, what were you thinking? Why did you keep chasing after all of these other things when God was right there? Think about your life story. If someone had written it in a book and your kids or your grandkids were reading it and knowing your thoughts and knowing the things that you did, would they question your motives and question some of the decisions you made? I know I'd be questioning a lot of the things I've done. So while it's easy to look at Israel and say, why don't you get it? Look at all the things God's done in your life, and yet we still struggle day to day with trusting him. After the death of Saul, the first king, David was anointed king of Israel. David and his mighty men retook Jerusalem, and they prepared the Ark of the Covenant to come back to the capital, to come back to Jerusalem after 20 years that it had been kind of hidden away. The Israelites looked at the Ark of the Covenant as the presence of God, and they thought that God's blessing would certainly be with them anytime the Ark was there in their midst. And at times they carried the Ark into battle. If you remember from your Sunday school classes, the Ark of the Covenant was this big golden covered box with angels' wings, and it said that God's presence literally rested there. There was a pillar of light at night, a pillar of fire, and a pillar of cloud by the daytime. So God's presence did focus there because God told them to make it, but there was nothing magical about this box. God just chose to use it as a symbol for them. David made plans to worship God as they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. Our church makes plans every Sunday as we come together and worship. Mark Guy and I get together. The tech team talks throughout the week, and they work on getting things to work together so that we can worship God in ways that are not distracting, like knocking over mics and candles and things. We don't practice those things. But spending time with God takes some forethought. And in this passage, David prepared for corporate worship. I'm going to read bits and pieces of it, but specifically listen to verse 4. He appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. David specifically called out three things, and we can see them there in this passage. To invoke the God of Israel. That means to call on God. We need to make sure that our focus as we come together as a church family and everyone that's here, that it's focused on God, that we're calling on the name of God and that it's not about our favorite songs or maybe being entertained by something or someone musically. It's about God. Our focus is on Him alone not our preferences, not who's doing what, not am I up front or am I in the back, where am I in all of this? It's about God, invoking, calling on God. David said, we want to thank God, recall what he's done, and thank him. This morning, we heard Ryan's testimony of how he came to faith in Jesus Christ. 
we thank God for what he's done in Ryan's life. And at other times in our services, we've heard testimonies from people about what God is doing and how he's working in their lives. We recall things that have happened in the past and we're reminded that God is faithful and that he walks through even the darkest days with us. We do that together as brothers and sisters. And then David said, we want to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Praising God is declaring who he is, his attributes, his character. In our songs, in our prayers, in the scripture that we read, we talk about God, his holiness, his majesty, his power, his everlasting love, his justice, his mercy, his kindness. Are those things you need to be reminded of? They are. We're focusing our thoughts and our hearts on the Almighty God because He alone is worthy of our worship and praise. Let me read verses 8 to 36. And you can listen along. You can jot down some thoughts as I'm going, but think about worship, why we're here and what we're doing. Here's David's song of thanks. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Israel, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Remember his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. When you were few in number, of little account, and sojourners in it, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people. He allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, Touch not my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of all the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult in everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Say also, save us, O God of our salvation, and gather and deliver us from among the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Then all the people departed, each to his own house, and David went home to bless his household. Just quickly, as I looked through these verses, here are some things that David did in his worship. He proclaimed God's deeds. He taught what God had done. They sang to God. They focused on God and His glory, not people. 
They looked for God. They recognized his strength and his presence in their lives. They remembered his eternal covenant promises. Israel was promised a land, that they would be a holy nation, that they would be protected, that God would show them mercy and grace and forgiveness, and that he would send a redeemer. They reminded the people of those promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What are the promises to us as a church? The promise of the Holy Spirit as our comforter, that the church would be established and nothing could stop the church, that his laws would be written on our hearts, that followers of Jesus Christ would be protected from the wrath of God, his judgment in the tribulation, that Christ will return, that Christ will judge the earth, and that you have eternal life in God. Those are things to remember and to rehearse. And then as we gather together, we share testimonies of God, the things that God has done in our lives, the teachings of God, his commands and his promises. That's why after our Sunday morning service, we have what we call Sunday school classes or Bible studies. And we spend time together in God's word, making sure that we know what it says so that we can follow and obey it. That we teach and preach all of God's word, not just the easy parts, not just the parts that make us feel good about ourselves, but the whole counsel of God. We proclaim God's salvation to others. We show his glory to the nations. Dear neighbors, know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. As you share life with them, and maybe it's a little bit harder now with our masks on, we're not talking as much, we seem to quickly shuffle in and out of our houses. But do they know what God is doing in your life? Do they hear praise from you, your coworkers, your family members? Or is it easier just to complain and talk about the things that aren't going well? Sometimes we fall into that. Do we hold God up as holy and have a healthy fear and awe of him? We think about his splendor, his majesty, his strength, and the joy. Do we bring an offering? Not only our money, but our time spent with the church family, spent with others sharing the good news. Do we remember that God is good and his love is eternal? Where do you turn for help and comfort? God, save us, David called out in the message that he shared. And then God's people said, amen. We're in the north, so we don't say amen as much as folks do in the south. Some of you that have been in other churches in different places, you hear amen a lot more, but it's, some of it's cultural. But when you say amen, you're saying, yes, I agree. This is true. All the people agreed, amen. When we worship together, we find unity. When we sing songs about God, we're singing the same words. We're reading the same scripture. There's unity in what we believe and what we're called to do. And then at the end, the people departed, each to his own house. David went home to bless his family. When you return home from church, is there a change? After you've heard God's word, are you saying, what do I need to do? What do I need to change in my thoughts or my actions? What should I be doing and focused on this week? Is your family, your coworkers, those around you blessed because you heard the word of the Lord and you're ready to follow it? That's a blessing that they would experience from you having worshiped, from you having been together in the church. Quickly, if you want to turn to Ephesians 5, 18 to 21, that was page 919 in the Pew Bible. Adam read this for us, so I'm not going to reread it because he did such a great job. I, I just wouldn't do it justice. But in that passage, it said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Scripture tells us that every believer has the Holy Spirit in their lives, in your life. The question is, is the Holy Spirit filling every part of your life? Or 
Are you keeping some for yourself? Not my entertainment, not my car, not my money, not this relationship. God, stay out of that. You've got Sunday, you've got Wednesday night, you've got growth group, but I need some of these things for myself. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is saying, God, you've got it all. I want you to be in full control. And what does that look like? It looks like singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It looks like giving thanks to God. When the Holy Spirit is guiding and directing your life, you are going to notice God at work, and you're quickly going to thank Him instead of thinking, I did a pretty good job this week. Look at all these things that came into line because of all the things I did. Does God equip you to do great things? Yes. But are you doing them because of Him? And is He empowering you to do it? Are you giving Him first credit and thanking Him? And then when we're filled with the Spirit, we're submitting to one another. It's not about my preferences and what I want to do and what I want to accomplish. It's how can I serve you? How can I help you? How can I pray for you? Instead of having an agenda of the things I want to do. That's what worship looks like in the New Testament church. And there's several other passages which we won't look at this morning. So as we think about our worship this morning. I'm not going to ask for you to turn these in, but you could share them with me later. Did we praise God in word and song? Did we pray together? Did we hear a testimony of salvation? Did you bring an offering? Were you taught God's word? And did you agree in unity? If you did, say amen. Robert's feeling more at home. Did you hear that, Robert? The church said amen. They said it quietly, but they said amen. amen. Let's hear it again for Robert. Amen. amen. And then individually, has it changed my heart? Has it changed my desires? Has it changed my thoughts? And will I let that affect my actions? There's only one way to be a Christian. And Jesus said that's to take up a cross and follow me. To be all in for Jesus. And say no matter what it takes, whether I'm carrying my brother or sister's burdens, I'm going to carry the cross. I'm willing to sacrifice my pleasure. I'm willing to sacrifice my things, my time, my money, whatever it is, I'm willing to give those things up for the glory of God and maybe to see someone else won to salvation. At our men's breakfast Saturday, we talked about spending time with other guys, whether it's young men or older men, but giving your time is probably the most precious thing you have. And if you're willing to invest some time in someone else, whether it's someone who doesn't know the Lord or a brother and sister in the Lord, you're giving of yourself and saying, you're important to me. I want to hear how your week went. I want to encourage you. I want to help you. Are you willing to be all in for Jesus Christ to the glory of God? And then will you obey his word when you hear it? And will that be a blessing to others? If there's still room on your note page, here's a couple of take-home questions just to think about. Is worshiping God together on Sundays a priority for you and your family? There are some people that are watching us online today who couldn't be here with us, and I'm glad you're worshiping with us. You're hearing the songs, hopefully you're singing them even at home. But we recognize that for health and other reasons, you can't always be here with us. But we have lots of opportunities besides Sunday morning, besides our Sunday school classes. We have growth groups throughout the week. We have prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. We have men's and women's breakfasts, different times that we gather together. And then there's always the one-to-one, -one, picking up the phone, calling someone, praying with them, asking them how their week went and encouraging them. Do you love God more 
than anyone or anything else? That's a tough question. That is really hard. Because when we start to identify those things in our lives that have taken a higher place than God, our relationship with God is going to grow and it's going to impact our relationship with other people. Believe it or not, your spouse and your kids are better off with you loving God first than loving them first because your worship is in the right place. Your love for them is going to be better when you have God on the throne. Do you really recognize and magnify God's holiness? When you come to pray to him, do you recognize that you're talking to the creator of the universe and that he's worthy of everything? Is there another one? Do you know God so well that you see that he alone is worthy of your worship and praise. We get to know God not through experiences, not how we feel, but we know him through his word. And God said we know him through his son, Jesus Christ. We see his characteristics. We see what he's like, how he acts through his word. So that means we have to spend time in his word, getting to know him better. Our ultimate purpose in life is knowing God, declaring his glory to those around us, and that is living a life of worship. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you don't have a right relationship with God. As Ryan shared with you this morning, it's not by his actions, but it was by faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Son of God, that we can know God. If you haven't taken that step, come talk to me after the service. If you're watching online, you can contact me through the church office. I'd love to spend some time talking to you more about how you can have this relationship with God through Jesus Christ that will change the rest of your life. And it'll bring all of the other relationships in your life into the right place because God is first. Mark's going to come we're going to sing a closing song. Please bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much that we could celebrate Ryan's baptism this morning, that we could be part of this step of faith in this young man's life as a church family and as his literal family here to celebrate with him. I just pray, Lord, your blessing on Ryan through his middle school and high school years as he's learning and growing. I pray that his focus would continue to be on you that he would learn to trust your word and he would grow not only in his faith, but in his obedience to your word. Lord, I pray that you'd help us through this coming week to be worshipers of you, to focus our hearts and our thoughts and our attitudes and actions on bringing glory to you. May the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It's in his name I pray. Amen.